Chima, great to get you on Real Vision. You're one of the people I've really, really wanted to sit down and talk to because you kind of cover all sorts of spectrums and I think there's just a lot to dig into. Before we start, your story, I think, is amazing. I'm you know, the son of an Indian immigrant to the UK, um, and you have a, a story as well. And I, th- I just think it's just part of you and part of your character. And I'd love you to share some of that coming from Sri Lanka. Sure. Um, well, first of all, thanks for um, including me. I've, I've been a fan of yours um, for a while, so um, it's great to be on. The short version of the long story is... Um, I was born in Sri Lanka, and uh, at the age of six, my parents uh, were posted to the Sri Lankan um, High Commission in Canada, and so I, we moved to um, Ottawa, myself and my sister and my parents. Um, in the middle of that tour of duty there, he was supposed to be there for four years. He was sort of a you know, mid-level kind of diplomatic person there. Um, the Civil War um, really accelerated, and at the time, there were multiple factions fighting each other. Um, there was the Tamil minority fighting for a homeland in Sri Lanka, but then there was also an extremist Sinhalese Buddhist uh, uh, minority as well, also fighting for a much more, you know, firm response. Um, long story short, my dad, who's a pretty devout Buddhist, wrote some articles. Um, he got in a lot of trouble. Um, his life was threatened, um, and we filed for refugee status in the Canadian government gave it to us. Um, and then, um, you know, it's a typical kind of hard scrabble immigrant story. You know, you kind of, you go off the government dole. Um, we grew up on welfare. My mom was a housekeeper, then a nurse's aide. My dad kind of bounced around jobs for a while. Um, I went to school in Canada, um, in electrical engineering. And then for a few years I spent as a, uh, as a derivatives trader and then moved to the oh, United sorry. States. Sorry. I was a derivative salesman. <laughs> well, exactly. Who were you working for? Uh, B- Bank of Montreal, BMO Nesbitt Burns. Okay, uh, yeah. So I traded cross currency swaps, US, Canada, US, uh, Japan, US, Mexico. Um, but really, you know, I started out as a coder, kind of like helping to design sort of math models, uh, and then was able to be a part of, you know, running a book and managing risk. Anyways, long story short, I really put a pin in that because in 2000, I moved to the United States to go back to more of an engineering skill set. And I worked at a bunch of startups. But what, what made you do that? Because, you know, finance at the time was like the thing to do, right? It was the brain drain was sucking into finance still at that point. What made you swim against the tide, go to California and start from there? It was, it was actually, uh, you know, I've been the byproduct of a lot of incredibly fortuitous decisions. Um, and some of them were not made by me. In that case, it was not. I had a boss. His name was Mark Kaplan, the sort of the, the capo, the boss's boss. And um, he gave me a uh, zero bonus. And, um, <laughs> I had one of those. and, you know, I was a high performer um, who I think had gotten a little over his skis. I thought too much of myself and I was pretty arrogant. Um, and I had become just, you know, not as good as I was when I was hungrier and more um, humble. And so he sent a wake up call and that's the, strongest wake up call you can get because like if you're expecting a you know several hundred thousand dollar bonus as a 21 year old kid and you know I had all these plans about paying off my debts and paying off my parents debts and buying them a house um and I had been able to do some of those things already um through this job I had really lofty expectations it was a huge um you know coming down to earth for me sorry for interrupting your video but I have a very important message to share At Real Vision, we pride ourselves on providing the very best in-depth expert analysis available to help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy. So if you like what you see on the Real Vision YouTube channel, that's just the tip of the iceberg. You should come to realvision.com and see how we're not leaving any stone unturned from publishing more in-depth videos, live discussions, written reports, and our latest feature, The Exchange, where you get a chance to engage with experts fellow subscribers, and learn from everyone's experience, which can't be wrapped in a video. It's an experience which you live and learn from. So if you go to the link in the description or go to realvision.com, it costs you just $1. I don't think it's something you could afford to be without. Do some of those things already um, through this job, I had really lofty expectations. 
it was a huge, um, you know, coming down to earth for me. Um, and it was more out of anger and spite that I said, fuck this, I'm quitting. Um, but it turned out to be a great decision. The embarrassment was really incredible for me because it was my first really big professional failure. Um, but I overcame it pretty quickly. And, you know, I've always had a tendency to kind of learn from things. And, you know, you, you learn that the cost of that failure is not that high. You know, I was still able to feed myself. I was still able to help my family. Nothing changed. And so, you know, all of a sudden, like just the consequence of trying and failing and then learning and, you know, being better and figuring out where you're not good and figuring out your blind spots, that stayed with me. Um, that's what that's what caused me to leave. So it didn't come from the best place. It came up from a peak of insecurity. Um, but I think I learned a lot from it. Yeah, a lot of people get paralyzed by fear of failure. And actually, failure, I always find, creates change. And change, there's always an opportunity. Well, the thing is that most cultures, this is why Silicon Valley is so special. The, the, the real thing that if it can export to the rest of the world, you know, I think sometimes it gets caricatured here as, you know, a bunch of dilettante, mostly guys, mostly thinking about stupid first world problems. And I think there's some of that. But when I came here, and I think that the enduring thing that this place has, um, which is a feature, um, is a bug everywhere else, which is that everybody else points to and laughs and mocks failure. And whereas here, it's a real badge of honor. Um, and it's because people have found that there's a secret that's hiding in plain sight in Silicon Valley, which is that when you fail, you learn. And instead, if you say you're learning things, then the more failures you have, it just means the more knowledge you're acquiring, which means the closer you are to figuring it out. Um, and the people that are the most respected here are the ones that have had some spectacular failures by conventional measure. But in reality, what they are are incredible learners. And then you know, that's caused them to have some huge outcomes. And so um, that's an incredible insight that it's hard to internalize. And most places just don't embrace that. I mean, one thing about Canada that I'll say is I'm the byproduct of an enormously important social safety net, you know, whether it was welfare, or whether it was, you know, uh, federally subsidized healthcare or, or, you know, federal and provincial subsidized education, I had the benefit of every single social safety net possible. And so, um, you know, a lot of my politics and a lot of my beliefs are governed because of that. But despite all of that, Canada wasn't super accommodating for somebody like me because I was willing to fail. And I was willing to be an outlier. And it's very difficult, to be quite honest, unless you're around other people who will tell you that failure is okay. And I didn't find that until I moved here in 2000, so 20, you know, 20 years ago. Um, because in, in every other place, they look at you and say, you should be towing the line and being part of the established aristocracy if you can be a part of it. So, um, you know, it's, a, it's an incredibly important thing that I think Silicon Valley got right. And when I moved here, I felt very much at home. Yeah, because the UK where I grew up was terrible for it as well. The UK you know, is even worse because like, you know, the entire peerage infrastructure and system and, you know, the classism that is so incredibly entrenched retards progress ultimately, right? And you're always fighting a very, very small number, an ever shrinking number of haves versus an ever larger pool of have nots. And really what they're fighting over is power. Um, because it's not that they're fighting over resources and money, but they're fighting over judgment, you know, and they're fighting over all these very elusive psychological things. And so the most important thing that the quote unquote, have nots can do is just decide that the power that the haves have doesn't matter anymore. And that deconstruction is actually an incredibly powerful element of societal evolution. And, and those that get it right thrive and those that don't kind of just go by the wayside. You know, Ray, Ray Dalio has this thing. Um, he had a really good book about four years ago. I, I can't say that I read it. Um, except the last few, few chapters he summarized in a YouTube video, which I really liked. And essentially, it was sort of like, you know, he talks about um, these economies and the uh, great, you know, sort of like periods of time as, as, you know, countries defined in these four phases, which are, you know, poor countries acting poor, then, you know, uh, a poor country that becomes rich, but still acts poor, then a rich country acting rich, you know, then a rich country that's become poor and hasn't realized it and still acting rich, and then, you know, a, a, a rich country becoming poor again. So it's this entire cycle. And uh, when you look at sort of like who's in the ascendancy of power geopolitically today, 
it's all these folks who have completely deconstructed a social hierarchy from 100 and 200 years ago that they've found to just be really not that helpful. I mean, that's an interesting point because something I've I think we've all seen it and you get this was your background you go to silicon valley you get involved in you know what becomes social media and the revolution but that changed everything for everybody it created a society of which there was no sovereign borders a society around which you could operate only within people that you wanted to operate within so you know i've always talked about this you could be a chihuahua lover and you only have to hang out with chihuahua lovers online and you can hate the rock lovers you can basically create any tribe you want and that's different mm-hmm. It also did something uh, really um, very visceral and psychological, Raul, in that it also reallocated um, power and influence. And w- when, when you see how the establishment reacts to social media today, you know, I, I would say that the U.S. election is a great window into this. The 2016 election was about sort of, you know, castigating um, Facebook. 2020 has really been the election of, you know, uh, throwing Twitter under the bus. Um, but really what it is, is an emerging realization by both the left and the right that social media reallocates power and influence in a way that disrupts the allocation of power and influence. Um, meaning, you know, it's much more likely, and Donald Trump, I think, is the canary in the coal mine. It's much more likely that future leaders of politics are really people that can um, coalesce movements online. And in that, you're much more likely for The Rock or Kim Kardashian or you know Charlie D'Amelio to be the next great politician than you are, um, you know, some uh, person who's steeped in policy and who really understands what to do. But you know, I, I heard you recently talking. I think it was on um, Carl Swisher's podcast about you know that potential move towards centrism. But it feels that it's the opposite. It's a bifurcation and it's a multi fragmentation. Right? It's difficult to get any consensus in a world where everybody shouts. I think that's true. Um, I think that basically what's happening is part, I think it's 50% what you said and 50% what I just said, meaning um, in that in that podcast. So if, to, to unpack it, I think what's happening is that you're absolutely right that that social media and just like the, the way that we organize ourselves now is becoming highly fragmented because you have a tendency, you know, to seek confirmation bias. And what that puts you into is your own echo chamber, whatever that is. That could be, um, you know, believers of climate change versus non-believers you know, vaxxers versus anti-vaxxers, um, you know, QAnon people versus, you know, non-QAnon people uh, across any dimension, no matter how normalized or no matter how extreme, you know, political views are, you can find your own echo chamber and you'll you'll stay there gladly because it's, it's confirmatory. Um, but, you know, in a place like the United States where there's still only two political parties and the allocation of power is a binary decision between two people, I think what it means is that you then optimize for the lowest common denominator and the political strategy in the future to win. I'm not saying it's right, but the strategy to win is one of centrism because the centrist platform now embraces, you know, 50% of the left's agenda and 50% of the right's agenda, because that's the only way mathematically to get a plurality, just the way that the U S is governed, the way the electoral college works, the way that, you know, these 50 States are really completely discontinuous bodies of, 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 um, electoral and political will. So it's um, basically building a Venn diagram and looking for the that's exactly of those connections. That's, it, that's, ex- that's exactly it. I think uh, politics in America for the foreseeable future is a cold calculation of the intersection of Venn diagrams. And one of the things that, that interests me that I'm sure you've got a view on is obviously online trust and digital identity. And, you know, because somewhere within this, there's fake news and deep fakes and you know it's becoming it's going to become an issue we don't really know how to deal with it yet how do we how do we solve for this is this a blockchain solution digital identity how do you see this evolving because i think something big is come is going to come out of this because out of crisis comes opportunity i think you're incredibly right here um my my view on this is that we are um and and i've said this before and I, i think it triggers people but it's true, um, but after 2000 and you know the the, the attacks in the World Trade Centers um, on 9/11, um, we had the creation in the United States of something called the Patriot Act, and what that essentially allowed was a level of government oversight um, that we still have, and if anything, has gotten even more dramatic than it was even 20 years ago. Um, and what it is is that basically the creation in, in you know over the last 20 years of a modern surveillance state and it's not just an American phenomenon it exists all over Western Europe it exists in Russia it exists in China 
It exists in every single country. Um, but we, we made it okay. And it was under the guise of our, of our physical safety. After the pandemic, I think that we're going to see the emergence of a, of a new form of the Patriot Act as well, except the key differentiation here is that it will be highly decentralized. And I think it will be um, individually controlled and administered. And there, I think that there will be a handful of companies that pay a critical role. So, you know, one example is Apple. I think that Apple's stance on privacy puts them at the forefront and in a really unique position to help. So how would this play out? I think that what you'll have is more trust, but more anonymity through a service that essentially allows you in sort of a public private key model to exchange critical information at key points of transaction. So, you know, if you wanted to walk into, you know, your offices at Google over the next four or five years, I suspect you'll take out your phone that you'll authenticate with your face or your retina or your fingerprint or a combination of those things, plus a code of some kind. It'll generate some kind of QR code in real time. And then you will scan it into a scanner. And what that code will basically tell people is not that it was Raul or Chamath, but it'll tell them that you're disease free, that you've been vaccinated against the measles, that you've been vaccinated against uh, the coronavirus, you know, COVID-19, but maybe also COVID-22 when that occurs, right? That um, some other airborne pathogen that all of a sudden emerged, you've been vaccinated against as well, that you've been recently swabbed and PCR tested for some other set of things. And then you'll walk into the building and you'll be able to you know, be economically productive with your other coworkers. And the reason we're going to go there is because every other person has an incentive to actually ask that the people around them sign up for the same restrictions. And so it's one of these unique opportunities where I think what we're seeing is actually people-sponsored surveillance, where there has been no other kind of thing you could have created in the world that would have basically said, I trust you, but I don't trust you. And so I need a third-party intermediary to basically validate that you are who you say you are and you are what you say you are. Um, and I think that that writ large is sort of where we're going to go. I think that you're going to basically walk around with a, with a digital passport the entries in that passport are not necessarily going to be visas that allow you to go to one country or another, but it's going to be statements that uh, can't be repudiated about things about you. And those things are going to be important for you to conduct your normal life going forward. There's a couple of logical parts of this I, that I'm interested in as well. I've been thinking through this, thinking, okay, if we all have a digital identity, and whether it's anonymous or not, one of the features of the current social media system and the online system is supernormal profits attracted to a few players. Now, if you're in control of your own data, now Tim Berners-Lee is working on stuff like this, there's ways that you can use this digital identity to get rewarded. I'm kind of thinking, here's a way of solving for universal basic income, because people who have more time on their hands can spend time online and you can get paid part of the advertising cut, essentially. You're saying something really important, which is that once you actually make... Um, I don't know how to say this in a non-pejorative way, and there probably is a better way, but conformity, a feature, um, confirmation, a feature, then you can design incentives around that kind of confirmation. So I think you're exactly right. I think companies and governments will be able to say, you know, I'm going to pay you or incentivize you for these specific forms of behavior and, and confirmation. That sounds like a redistribution of wealth because the people who got super rich were the people who basically used us for free. Exactly right. I think that's exactly right. And that solves a lot of problems because you don't even need to tax people because it's hard to tax these companies. Yes. But if you're paying it directly to me for using my attention, fine. That's a, that's a fair I think, societal... I, I, I've said this a couple of times, but, um, and it's something I haven't spent enough time maybe discussing, but I really believe that when you look at efficient market theory, you know, that, that's a model that worked um, to define extremely capital-intensive industries because the, the, the point of differentiation was a universal resource that everybody had, which is money or had access to effectively. And so markets would compete away profits. And so, you know, efficient markets sort of gave us um, a warm, fuzzy blanket to roll ourselves around in that capitalism in, its, in the way that we had designed it would work. That's not true anymore because now there are these critical assets that nobody ever thought would get created. You can't even define them in law. You know, what is a network effect? How would you define that for the purposes of law? that a company can create that basically creates um, 
an involuntary form of entrenchment and, and effectively quasi-regulatory capture. That's a, that's a crazy dynamic. And so, you know, the only way that you can compete those companies away is actually through incentives and taxation. It's not through government intervention. For me, it's the rise of behavioral economics. Behavioral economics is basically destroying all the previous forms of understanding business models. It's, you know, because that is what, once you apply big data to people's attention, you're creating incentive systems. And that changes everything. And governments, and we'll, we'll come on to this in a bit, I think it's all coming out of central bank digital currencies. I think the rise of behavioral economics is, you know, it got led by Facebook, Google, and everybody else, as we know, I and mean, Daniel Kahneman and everybody else was involved in it. But I think it's coming to government as well in a much more meaningful way. There's, before we get onto some of this stuff, there's the other thing, I don't know if you've been following the whole India stack story. I have. I, in fact, I was I was actually going to tweet something out today. Today's uh, what day is it today? Uh, November the sixteenth. Because I have a I have a payments business in India that I've been working on for almost ten years now, and it's absolutely exploded. Um, ten years in, it's just a ten year overnight success story, um, and on the back of the pandemic. Um, but uh, I've been following UPI and Adar uh, for a long time. I've been a big I've been a big believer in those in that stack. Me too. And Silicon Valley kind of missed the whole thing, and I'm like. There's 1.3 billion people on a super fast UPI payment system. India stack, as they're building it out, you'll have your medical records or your KYC. I mean, yeah. the only thing people don't like about it, it's, it's not distributed, it's centralized. But Exactly. I think that that's the key element of it, which I think will limit its use. But I think um, it will be used so pervasively in finance that that's good enough because that's a multi, you know, sort of, hundred billion dollar, maybe it's a trillion dollar market. Yeah, I mean, I, just, you know, just the frustrations of KYC in this current world is ridiculous. I mean, it's ri simply ridiculous. Ridiculous. And that can be solved so quickly once you have digital identities. Yeah. But the problem is, is everybody thinks this is going to be a destruction of your freedom. So there's that big kind of shit fight going on. Well, I don't think that it's, it's not that everybody, I always think there's a vocal minority who basically needs to have a view to sound smart. And most of the time, they're pretty fucking stupid, to be honest with you. I mean, you know, it's like the, the, the loudest people are never the smartest people. Um, and they're just the ones that want to be heard because they want attention for some other set of reasons that come from their own psychology and insecurity. I think that, you know, anybody who spends the time to learn about anything always comes off as pretty moderate and boring because they tend to just come to a balanced perspective. The more you learn, the more confusing things are so that the more, you know, kind of um, almost conservative in the presentation of the facts one is. Um, it's when you're just starting to learn about something and you think that you can be heard that you start to just spout off and sound, frankly, you just sound, to the people that know more, you just sound like a dumbass. So here's something I want to learn about and you know all about is, look, there's two things. One is that there is a dichotomy going on between Main Street and Wall Street, you know, the equity markets at all time highs and clearly, Main Street's totally fucked, and people don't get this. I mean, it's destroyed because we've now got a secular change of business model going on as well. Yeah. What do you think about that, and how is this going to evolve? I think that we have had, since Ronald Reagan, really, um, one form of economic policy and one way to view the interaction of fiscal and monetary policy, which is effectively trickle-down economics. We've always done it under Democrats and Republicans. We've always thought the right way to think about this is effectively some forms of low taxation for corporations and the idea that put the money into the hands of people and what those people will do is redistribute that. And so I tend to think that um, that's turned out to not be true anymore because I think what we're learning is that it's just way too complicated. The financial incentives for these companies are too perverse. And so the distribution of dollars to the edges isn't happening the way that we thought it could have in a much simpler economy in 1980. And so I think we have to go to the extreme other end, which is to say, okay, maybe the right way to think about this is to actually put money into the hands of individuals, let them spend. By spending, they're doing two things. They're going to stimulate the economy, but they're also driving more capital markets efficiency because they're going to be voting with their dollars about which products that they want to win right? And 300 million people's decisions in America, 330 million people's decisions in America, is probably a lot more valid than the 500 CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. 
And that signal is probably much more high fidelity and, and more reliable. And so I think that this was an opportunity in the pandemic to actually experiment more with putting money into the hands of individuals and then observing which businesses that they pick on the presumption that that is actually a better implementation of efficient markets theory. And that instead of going top down, this bottom up is actually the right way to go. Um, the thing to remember is that you know we've spent the last 30 to 40 years completely perverting the incentives in the capital markets, right? We were an environment that rewarded diversity, that rewarded specialization, that rewarded um, R&D, that rewarded savings, and that rewarded future profits. And then over the last 20 or 30 years, we've completely flipped that script. And instead, what we've told CEOs, it's about ruthless efficiency at the sake of resiliency. You know, it's, it's about consolidation. It's about current profits. It's about consolidating dividends and consolidating share purchase agreements or share purchase buybacks. It's about current redistribution to a small money class. Um, and then a thing like the pandemic basically, you know, exposes that the emperor has no clothes and that most of these boards were making these decisions to placate a CEO who was making these decisions to reinforce the compensation model that those board directors gave them, you know, and then when you unlook, look at the incentives, the board directors get paid 500,000 bucks a year. So it's just a bunch of ex bureaucrats that get, you know, can collect a million bucks by being on four boards and acting like a dipshit. Um, and it's a CEO who basically doesn't know their head from their ass. Um, didn't know how to invest, didn't know how to do R and D. You know, the investable universe in the meantime shrank from 8,000 companies in America to 4,000, right? Um, we literally have spent, you know, zero on R and D, you know, we've been completely passed over by countries like China. Um, and so you just throw your hands in the air and say, wow, we need a wholesale reset of what's happening. The simplest way to do it is to let, uh, people decide, you know, I'm not, I don't think that I need to punish a crappy airline company and their crappy board and their crappy CEO. Um, but I do think that if you gave consumers money, the consumers would also realize that that product was crappy and just use a different competitor. And then that would solve it. So how do you give people the money? Because I mean, what you're just partly talking about here is- Just cut them a check. Just cut them a check. Just cut them a and, check. And, and by the way, we did that, right? You know, uh, in the United States, we gave people money. Um, it's just that, you know, idiotically, we stopped. And, you know, for, for, for every dollar we gave, we gave 10 or $12 to all kinds of, again, 500 CEOs of which I would say 100 are really smart and 400 are, eh, you know, if I'm being really kind of kind about them. Um, and so, you know, what, what, what do we do there? And then, you know, it turned out that, you know, $660 billion went into an entire program, PPE, that turned out to be riddled with fraud. What were we thinking? Well, I mean, this is what, what I was kind of coming into is, is once you put the banking sector in the middle of this, bunch of stuff doesn't work. So the, the money mechanism, the central bank prints money, it goes to the banks, it doesn't go. So there's no velocity of money. When you've got a structured program like the PPP, what happens is it goes to the wrong people. And it, it feels like that process of the banks having a monopolistic control over the distribution of money is probably going out the window. It's probably going out the window. Um, you know, we've seen sort of, uh, I think the banking industry will not have some fatalistic death blow. I think it's sort of death by a thousand cuts. I think that we are seeing now the emergence of an entire class of fintech companies that are slowly eroding the value proposition of entrenched financial institutions. Um, it will take another 10 or 20 years for us to see it happen in enough scale where you can see sort of these you know, the, the concept of too big to fail to me is just asinine. It's insane. It's actually should be the opposite. It's like no bank should ever be too big to fail that it matters. You know, we should have many, many small banks of which there can be umpteen failures and the system just moves on and it's and it's and it can self heal. Um, you know, like what does it mean to actually have six banks where the FDIC limit on deposits is still a million dollars? Well, by definition, you can't you can't be an enormously big bank be, uh, with with a whole bunch of assets of which any individual account is less than a million. Uh, that, that's just the reality of the law of large numbers. And so there's you know enormous amounts of pools of capital that are effectively uninsured. Doesn't make any sense. So I just think that financial institutions uh, and then 
you know, the, the, the zero rate environment has completely um, exposed these folks. Um, so I just think the incentives in financial organizations um, are being rewritten. And 20 to 30 years from now, I don't think you'll have these too big to fail banks. I think they will have kind of decayed to the wayside. And instead, you'll have hundreds and thousands of small sort of vertical specialists in every specific niche. Yeah, I mean, somebody asked me yesterday on Twitter, what's the biggest TAM available? And it's money. Yeah, I saw your answer to that, to, to Super Mugatu, to Dan McMurtry. My, yeah. answer, was, my answer was energy. Um, I understand where you're coming from when you say money, because I do think the business of money is enormous. Um, Just that even energy is priced in money. I mean, it, it is the denominator yeah, fact, of everything fact, we have. And, what I was going to say is mine was a more tactical answer that to me is more obvious to disrupt. I think like, you know, the disruption of energy um, will have the most important impact in uh, reallocating and reassessing geopolitical power. It actually solves um, most of the big pernicious corrosive issues that we have geopolitically. Yeah. Talk to me about that climate change and technology and solutions, because it's huge and it's been something it's difficult to talk about. It has been difficult to talk about because you get wildly attacked for even talking about it but it's clearly one of the biggest opportunities we've ever seen it really is and this again speaks to whenever people get really emotional about it i just think they're a fucking moron um like the the left should just shut up and realize that you know uh climate change is simply not a politicization of having breathable air but it's just breathable air and it's a non-political issue and the right should shut the fuck up and realize that um climate change is the simplest path to normalizing the geopolitical um, shit show we've been in for 20 years. Ever since 9-11, you know, we've been literally and figuratively, but literally on a death march to destabilize the Middle East in this wag the dog scenario where, you know, making it the centralized place where all the chaos in the world happens is our simplest path to safety and security domestically in the United States. But that hasn't turned out to be that way because it's created all kinds of other whack-a-mole problems that, that, um, we never anticipated. Now, knowing what they did, maybe that was the best solution. I don't know. I wasn't obviously in the bowels of that decision making. But in 2020, what I can tell you is if you want to fix our problems with Russia, China, and the Middle East, the simplest thing is uh, climate change. So why is that? Well, if you actually have the cost of you know wind and PV, um, batteries, et cetera, cheaper than the cost of fossil fuels, the simple economics, forget the, the value added of, you know, uh, of clean air and, you know, a better earth and less deforestation, less destruction, less, 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 all of that is good. But at a simple level, if the cost per gigawatt hour basically gets cheap enough and it's cheaper than fossil fuels, you stop ripping the fossil fuels out of the ground. Now, where are the fossil fuels? They're in the Middle East and they're in Russia. Now, what do those two bodies of countries and country, what are they forced to do? They're forced to monetize all of that today, right? Because if they see a, a, a cross curve that's going down, 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 where at some point by 2030, the price of fossil fuels is basically effectively negative, their decision is, oh gosh, we need to monetize all of this oil right now. And now that has this other order effect, which is then the price of oil drops even further, right? We had this crazy contango event in May of 2020, where, you know, you had negative, you know, 30 or $50 per barrel oil. Um, but the reality is that the Middle East will monetize their oil. Russia will monetize their oil. They'll pull all of those future profits into today's profits, and then they'll try to reallocate and diversify. Um, why is that an important thing? Well, it's an important thing because all of a sudden there isn't as much money left to, you know, to have all kinds of um, excursions, um, to have all kinds of other kinds of things that could have mattered when you had a 50-year supply of $30 oil. You know, extremism all of a sudden becomes very unprofitable to fund. State-sponsored actions become very unprofitable to fund. You have to become, you know, much more centrist Right, and you have to be focused on current stability of the population because you know the money is running out. So you have to be much more aggressive in educating your population, in making sure that they're well and they're healthy, that they're fed, and that they can then create an economic substrate that helps you transition away from oil. All of that is a massive 
thing that just consumes time and energy and focus. Nobody has time to be hacking and blowing things up and being extremist when you're focused on economic survival up and down the political spectrum. And so, you know, climate change has this incredible feature that is it's a Trojan horse for normalization. Now, let me tell you something else. For the economic salvation of the Middle East, it's an incredible platform. Why? Because much like oil, the Middle East has this incredible distribution of sunlight that is just not true in other countries. Now, how does that play out? Well, when the price of PV and the price of solar becomes super, super, super cheap, and over time, we figure out there's one massive thing in climate change. There's, there's a set of big order issues, but one big order issue is how do you run a furnace at extremely high temperatures? Now, you may think, what the hell does that have to do with anything? It happens to do with everything. How do you refine oil? How do you make plastics? How do you manufacture steel? How do you do anything is with a high temp furnace. If you figure out how to capture the sunlight, which the Middle East is in an overwhelmingly better position to do, quite honestly, because they just get more sunlight than the rest of us. You know, I think, I think the country is, I think it's like Armenia that has the most sunlight of any country in the world. So theoretically, the richest country from a resource perspective is Armenia. Now, but take, go back to the Middle East. You have a ton of sunlight. There will be somebody somewhere that invents a, you know, an arc furnace that can essentially be run with photovoltaics or wind or something. And all of a sudden, you know what the, the Middle East will be able to do? They will disrupt China. Why? Every single low-cost manufacturing capability will move there. Now, China already has a demographic death bomb that they're dealing with, which is that you know in the next 100 years, they're going to have 500 million people in that country, right? Because that one China policy, that ch one child policy has created such an overhang of older people versus younger people. They have this massive inverted demographic pyramid. It's the exact opposite of India, that you are on a death march to having half as many people. So if you have a combination of half as many people all getting older and a manufacturing substrate that's moving to a place that's lower cost because you have photovoltaics and rich, cheap, abundant energy, all of a sudden the Middle East becomes you know, a renaissance of GDP. And we know what GDP does. It normalizes everything. People want cars, they want clothes, they want to go to McDonald's, they want to have Starbucks. We're kind of seeing it in Saudi now. They kind of get this, right? They get it. They get, Saudi I mean, Arabia gets it. They are, they are at the leading edge of it. And so, you know, I think what MBS is doing is actually really incredible because he realizes he has to monetize the oil and transition the economy. Once somebody comes to him and knocks on his door and says, I have a set of climate change solutions that can really, you know, make you a manufacturing hotbed. Of course, he says yes. By the way, the other thing is, you know, the Middle East was manufactured after World War II to divvy up oil so that the first world countries had access to a critical resource. But the Middle East has tens of countries really embedded within the, you know, there's probably 50 countries in there. You know, there's 30 plus dialects that could be 30 plus countries. So the reality is you're going to have a fragmentation in the Middle East, right? And you'll have a, a renaissance in manufacturing and GDP that basically makes um, extremism just inefficient and kind of not a good feature, right? It's a failed startup. It can't raise its series B right? Got out of the gate strong, raised the series A, but oh, no more product market fit, right? The market moved away from it. Think of Russia, same situation, except that Russia can't actually deploy, you know, a manufacturing substrate necessarily as easily as the Middle East can. So if you look at climate change, you save the earth, you know, you stop the extinction of all these species, you take carbon out of the atmosphere, and you basically create a soft landing for geopolitical normalization, less war, less strife, less famine, less extremism. Wow. I got involved in climate change Twitter by mistake once, and it, it, was, a, it was a pretty tough fight. And I actually just want to understand, okay, what was the real, what was the, the behavioral motivation behind many people? And a lot of it was basically the same thing that you've talked about, is people are up to here right now. And they're thinking, my, my gas price is going to go up or my tax is going to go up. But actually, technology is deflationary, not inflationary. You know, one, one thing that people like you make popular, people like me make popular, is this idea of first principles thinking. I don't think, think that you can build a following anymore, at least in substantive areas like economics and Bitcoin or climate change, 
without at some level being a first principles thinker. And I think a lot of these people that spout off on Twitter or Facebook or wherever um, are just afraid. And I don't think they really take the time to understand. Like I said, they're more interested in burnishing their social media credentials. The problem is it's always fleeting because they'll get exposed for basically being a rube. And um, I think that there's a lot to be said for being thoughtful and first principles in your thinking. And this is why, again, I think the politicization of climate change is so stupid because it's kind yeah. of like if you if you centralize what's happening, nobody can disagree that any of these things are bad. And so, you know, guys like us will present it. And, you know, the, the extremism of all kinds, I think now um, are being exposed for being at 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 the worst, simplest case, inefficient. It's an inefficient way to accomplish your goals because you sound like a cr fucking crying, whining baby. And people are just tired of that shit. Just shut up, stop whining. Let's find a simple, reasonable solution for an important problem that we can all agree on and let's move forward. And what's amazing about finding solutions that involve massive change is there's massive wealth to be made and massive advantages. You know, if you've massively dropped the price of fuel, everyone's going to benefit. Whoever comes up with some groundbreaking science and turns it into a product is going to become hugely wealthy. Great. Everybody's benefited. I think that people get too wrapped up in wealth creation today. Again, it's become a popular sort of like distraction. And I think that there's like a secret hiding in plain sight. Yet again, like, you know, like, a good mental outlook, I think mental health is just about finding some of these secrets in hiding in plain sight and saying, okay, wow, okay, that's okay. Now, what is an example of that related to wealth? Very few people become wealthy by focusing on getting wealthy. And of all the rich people that I've met, they've always been focused on solving a problem. The byproduct is that the bigger the problem is that they solve and the more powerful, um, that the solution it is that they deliver, the more wealth that they create, but it's a complete accidental byproduct of problem solving. You know, I tweeted this out a few weeks ago that um, solving climate change is what will create the world's first trillionaire. But the reason I said that is not because of the price of photovoltaics or the price per gigawatt hour of anything. Um, but if you, if you take this framework and apply it to climate change, what you're doing is you're actually bringing peace, right? Well, what is the economic value of peace? It's infinite. So even if you captured a few basis points of infinity, it's probably a few billion dollars. That's why the world's first trillionaire will be in climate change. And so, you know, that person, I don't think is trying to be a trillionaire. I think that person is going to be obsessed with carbon capture or obsessed with, you know, building an arc furnace, but the byproduct will be peace. And so the economic rewards will be in the trillions. And I'm okay with that. I don't think it'll be me, but I'm not jealous of that person. In fact, I'm hopeful that he or she is somewhere in the world right now, you know, learning about this problem and will go off and do it. What I, I find interesting is the, the trend towards applying an engineer's mindset to global problems, because it used to be a political mindset, but the actual answer generally is a pragmatic, um, cold, hard look at a problem and find a solution. And it's, it's, it's nothing to do with politics. And, and that creates much better outcomes. I mean, again, I mean, the classic example of that is Bitcoin, right? When you want to reinvent a whole monetary system from scratch, that comes out. My whole view with Bitcoin was always that it's much better to be pragmatic and, and lay out a moderate case, which is that it's a hedge in a portfolio um, against the sort of traditionalist financial infrastructure. And so many people would get mad because they would anchor on this extremist view that it had to be everything. It had to be the solution and panacea to everything. The problem with that view is that that's just not how you maximize demand, right? When you think about um, products that really get to scale, um, there's a simplicity. And what that simplicity gives is people a very simple decision to make. Do I want to use this or do I not want to use it? And so if you want, you know, for example, Bitcoin, to get to mass market scale, the most powerful thing that you can do is describe it in simple pragmatic terms that don't require zealous belief. Um, and so it's just, a, it's just an example to me that sort of reinforces this idea that extremism never wins. And kind of like centrism is sort of the, the value maximizing function. 
Yeah, because when I'm looking at that whole world, I see all of the other platforms, blockchains, tokens, and I'm just thinking, okay, well, here's a big, diverse, deep, rich universe. And it's I can't just see it being about Bitcoin. Yes, Bitcoin's this great asset, and it's a wonderful gift for us all, and thank you very much, and we can all make some money. But this whole space, okay, that's super interesting to me because it's, it's, it, it is anti-fragile in its overall way, and it offers a whole bunch of solutions to the problem of finance, which is a total shit show. It's true. It just requires um, sort of like a de-escalated, like I, I find that a lot of people in Bitcoin, and it's so funny because like many of them got there well after I did. Um, they're just so arrogant about it. And I don't know, maybe I'm just dumber, but like, I just don't understand why people need to believe so much versus, you know, view it more pragmatically and unemotionally, because I think they'll find more success in the more unemotional, you know, treatment of what it is. So like another example is like the entire DeFi movement. I was, I got laughed at because somebody asked me, Laura Shin asked me what DeFi was. And I was like, I have no idea, but I own Bitcoin. And and, and I was just telling the truth, which is like, I just don't, I don't have the time to learn about all this stuff. And, you know, at some point somebody will explain it to me and I'll know a little bit better, but it's not to say that it's not important, but it is to say that everything has a time and place. And if we are going to focus our energies on making Bitcoin mass market and scale, we have to dial down this zealous rhetoric and dial up pragmatist rhetoric. Pragmatist rhetoric is what will get your mother and your grandmother to have Bitcoin in, in their wallets. That's right. I mean, I mean, I, I love Michael Saylor and his interview has been amazing. And he's on Real Vision, but he speaks in a term that no corporate treasurer understands. They, they don't want to hear about hornet's nests or anything else. They want to hear about diversification of portfolio returns and stuff like that. So to your point, look, I, I, I've started an insurance company that's doing a bunch of um, very, very uh, esoteric, exotic um, insurance policies. Um, and, you know, one of the interesting things that I've learned with my co-founder, my partner in this, he's the CEO, I'm, I'm just the chairman, but um, is how many of these corporations view their balance sheets and, you know, how they're buying all kinds of esoteric insurance. And the instant thing, Raul, that pops to the top of my head is, wow, these guys should also own Bitcoin as something like that. If they're going to own cat bonds and they're going to own business interruption risk insurance and all kinds of, you know, hedges on PMI, my gosh, why don't they own some Bitcoin? Well, it's because the presentation of that idea is done in such a, in such a way where they're forced to make a leap too far. And because if you, if you decompose what the treasurer, the CFO is, is how the lens in which they're making decisions, it's just career risk. Right, it's it's that it's that old adage. It's just it's you're never going to get fired for buying IBM, right? And so you're never going to get fired for just having the money sit in a corporate account zero with earning zero at J.P. Morgan. Then you know pounding your fists on the table for Bitcoin. Um, so what we need is again more pragmatism around what it is. Um, and I've I, I've always found the presentation of the idea as. Uh, a deeply fundamentally uncorrelated hedge to the existing financial infrastructure to be kind of boring, not that salacious, but very pragmatic and effective. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, a lot of people want to get the institutions into the space. And I keep explaining to people, stop talking about libertarian philosophies and, you know, all of this stuff. Everybody in the asset allocation space, the boring pension funds use something called BARA, B-A-R-R-A. It's yeah. an asset allocation model. You need to go and talk to them how it fits into the Barra model, and they'll go, oh, perfect, I'll speak to my trustees. It's as simple as that. It's so boring, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's like this is the boring um, sort of like, you know, blocking and tackling that's required. And I think it's fine, you know, for look, I mean, I have different personas. We all have different personas. And, you know, there are parts of my persona that are very extreme in certain views on certain topics in certain markets. Um, but I've also learned that, you know, there's a time and place for that. But then there's a time and place for just pragma pragmatic product building, blocking and tackling, and reputation and trust when you're trying to get something to scale. Another example that I've been at the forefront of is in SPACs, right? If I was zealous about SPACs, you wouldn't have seen the change in the capital markets that we've seen in two short years. What attracts you to SPAC? What attracts you to SPACs? What is it, apart from the fact that it's just easier to get something away? 
and do some interesting economics. What what what's so great about it? The SPAC is really important. Well, I'll give you why it's important to me, and then I'll give you why it's important to an entrepreneur. Selfishly, for me, it allows me to basically be a conduit and act as a principal while I take companies public. Meaning, I can use my balance sheet to basically empower companies to fulfill a mission that I believe and underwrite in, and then I can be a big part of of them as they grow and scale. And so, you know, the only places to make money in the in the private technology markets are all the way up front at the Series A, you know, the Sequoias and the Benchmarks and the Andreessens of the world. I used to do that at Social Capital. We did a good job, but it's very hard and the, the returns are extremely long dated. Or you just wait for these companies to get baked and do it at the back end where instead of putting in tens of millions, you put in hundreds of millions or billions if you're able to do it. And you own the same amount as they end up owning anyways, 10, 12, 15, 20%. Um, and then you can basically help them grow and scale. So that's selfishly, you know, why I was attracted to a SPAC. But then, then now you get into the Venn diagram part of why I liked it and why it makes sense for an entrepreneur. It's because you can talk about the future. And the most important thing in underwriting returns, as you and I know, in disruptive technologies, is all about future returns. You know, I don't care about 2019 and 2018. Tell me about 2028 and 2029. What is your plan? And the only way that you can talk about that when you're bringing a company public is through an S4 process because it's a merger, because the S1 process doesn't allow that. The SEC rules are very strict around, you know, basically talking about future prospects, future strategy, future cash flows. You can't even produce a forecast. So the S4 and a SPAC, you know, at the intersection between now my desires and the entrepreneur's desires is about talking about the future in detail. And then for the entrepreneur, what they get is, you know, a couple of things that are not as important to me, but important to them, which is speed. You take an 18 month process and compress it to hundred days and certainty of price. So you, you exactly know what your cost of capital is and you and your board can underwrite that and decide whether that's too expensive or not. And is it also an arbitrage? Because look, private markets and public markets trade at different prices relative to each other. And for a period of time, the pre we work world, um, it was all trading at a premium, then it trades at a discount. So now if the private if the private markets are trading at a discount, this is an easy way to arbitrage the value difference as well. Because it's pretty quick, right? You can take advantage of it. Yeah, I, th- I think that um, I think it's more appropriate to describe what you say on a company by company level. I'm not sure that it's necessarily true that, you know, a company like WeWork, which is in a very different space than, for example, like an AI chip company, that, you know, that there are these impacts where, all of a sudden the person that's underwriting the chip company all of a sudden sees a discount where they otherwise would have been paying a premium. I'm not sure that that's necessarily true, but I I do think broadly speaking, what you're saying is right, which is that um, right now there's this weird opacity between the private and the public markets. And the most important thing I think is that mostly for your viewers is that, or your listeners as well, is that the returns that are available in the private markets are still blocked. There is no access for average, ordinary, normal folks to get access to that return stream. The SPAC does basically do that because it allows you to pull forward the IPO two or three years into the into the typical you know decision making process that the company has, and then you can own that in an exchange tradable or you know a uh, market tradable security. Um, and so I think that there's a democratizing effect here, which is very important and powerful. And what's your view on tokenization? Is that going to take play a role in some of this eventually? Because again, it's a different way of bringing companies into the hands of others earlier on. I think it will. I'm going to say something kind of crazy, which is that I think that the tokenization is actually what not is not necessarily for the company itself and and the the unit allocation of ownership, but things that the companies will want to create um, and then pass on to its uh, unit holders or or stakeholders, if you will. So, for example, I could see that a company um, creating carbon credits and tokenizing those and giving them to everybody that's a stakeholder in the business. Yeah, just different things of different value that that you can't realize now. You can realize in different. Ways. I could see a company that you know basically. Uh, this is going to sound crazy as well, but you know, a token that you can redeem for free vaccination. You know that yeah. you give to all stakeholders um, because it's important for a company to have all their uh, employees, but all their stakeholders as well, be healthy. So there's all kinds of like crazy things that you can. But see it goes happening. back to that behavioral incentives discussion we had before. Once you've got tokens, you can create all sorts of behavioral incentives that didn't exist. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right.
So the last thing I want to come on to is something also you, you've been looking at and we're looking at at Real Vision is education. Yeah. It just feels that everything has changed. We kind of knew it. We knew that video was changing everything in the way that software did, but it feels like education is one of the big ones out there. What's your view on this? Yeah, I, I, I think that this is the grand equalizing force. Um, I don't think that we should have a world where there are equal finishing lines but I do think that we would be in a much better place if we had equal starting lines. Um, you know, I have been a citizen of three countries. You know, I'm a Sinhalese Buddhist male born in Sri Lanka where I was part of the majority, you know, grew up in Canada where I was part of the minority. And now in America, I've essentially become part of the moneyed establishment for lack of a better word, you know? So I've lived a very kind of crazy odd life where I have all this cognitive dissonance from very different uh, phases of my life. Um, but the best thing that happened to me was in those critical years of six through, you know, 20, I was in a place that valued an, uh, an evening, star, an even starting line, and be, you know, growing up in Canada, it wouldn't have been the same in the United States. You know, my father was, my father died five years ago, but he, you know, uh, had diabetes for a very long time, um, struggled with alcoholism, struggled with depression, um, very turbulent household. But the great savior was the fact that we had state-sponsored healthcare and state-sponsored education. So if I was in the United States and we were dealing with all those issues, my, I mean, my life would just not been anywhere. So what is my takeaway from that? I think places like Harvard and Stanford are really corrosive. They're kind of worthless. They, they've created a monoculture of checkboxing dipshits. And, you know, they are money management institutions that you know, basically dole out power and influence based on acceptance and admittance that just entrench, you know, the money class. Like there's not a single person that's the son of a rich kid that I've ever met who I think is as smart as the person who actually made the money. You know, these kids are fucking morons. And so they're better off going to some crappy school and finding something that they're passionate about versus riding on daddy's coattails. Um, and so, you know, we have an entire political and, and economic and educational class that doesn't believe that that should be what's happening. In fact, that if you're rich, you have a right to keep your kid rich and you have a right to keep your kid powerful. And that to me is, it's kind of really disgusting. So, um, you know, the faster we rip that down and rip it apart, uh, the better off we'll be, you know, that the smartest kids should be going to the best schools. Well, what is the best school? Well, the best school now is actually just the best teachers. Well, where are the best teachers? The best teachers are actually all around the world. And so really what we need to have is a very different form of what we value. Well, I, I, one of the things I think about is that teachers, they're going to be the new rock stars. Teachers are going to get paid millions of dollars, millions. I hope, they do. So. I hope they do. Yeah. Because we can change all of this now, because basically you applied the SaaS business model to education. I'll give you an example. Um, you know, I send my children to a school that's still closed. Um, and what's crazy to me is, okay, well, they're sitting here and they're learning virtually, but the teacher on the other end could be any teacher. And so I think to myself, wow, well, I understood, I understand why I sent them to the physical place I did when the school was open. That made sense. You know, that's, they're, they're, we're, we're really paying for social interaction. I don't think we were ever paying for education, right? Um, and, and I think that this pandemic actually probably made that pretty obvious. Right. If you can learn at home or you can learn in the school, what is the difference? The difference is you can hang out and, you know, you develop social norms and hierarchies and you learn to deal with all kinds of important psychological building blocks that make, you know, a kid able to function as an adult in society. That's really what school is there for. And so if you take that away, then you should be learning from the best history teacher, the best science teacher, the best math teacher. That person should be running a massive online course. You know, we should have a common curriculum where you know, nine to 10 Eastern, every, you know, 10th grader should be learning from the best algebra teacher. And that person should be making, you know, 10 million bucks a year. We should, they should be getting paid more than an athlete. And I'm not entirely sure now, this sounds a bit controversial, that, that kids need to socialize together physically because they already socialize in Minecraft and online digitally. And I'm not sure that the same things that we had growing up in a playground and, you know, having your first fight or whatever it was or flirting with the first girl is even going to apply necessarily because kids now don't yeah. necessarily do that. They get together for sports and stuff like that. 
I think you're saying something that's much more evolved than my thinking, but I, I agree with you. I just haven't spent enough time to get psychologically comfortable with that yet. Um, I'm still anchored in this place where I believe that physical spaces and physical interaction are really important just because I don't think we've evolved just from an evolutionary perspective enough where um, we are capable of yeah. processing that in a healthy way. So, you know, I mean, I do think that it's true that the brain of, you know, an equivalent human 500 years ago and today is very different, right? Um, what its needs are and what its capabilities are. I, I mean, I don't think we have any empirical proof, but I think we have a lot of anecdotal proof that, it, that, that, that that's true. Now we'll be able to study. And I do think that, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, you know, our great, great grandchildren's brains will be very different. And I do think you're probably right that we're going to live in a world that has far less physical interaction and far more virtual interaction. And so we will adapt and cope um, and we will thrive. Um, it's just going to take a few generations. And the problem is that our generation and our, and, you know, uh, and our children's and our children's children's will be the guinea pigs, will be the bridge to that new evolutionary frame. And so I feel a little sad and nostalgic. Yeah, and we're because we're the last generation as Gen Xers, we're the last generation who didn't do that. Yeah, we're the last generation to care about physical concerts. Like my son came to me and he saw Travis Scott in a concert, and I said, "Excuse me," and he's like, "Yeah, I was on Fortnite." I was just like, "What?" And he's like, "Yeah, I'm listening to you know we have, we're we're going to do a viewing party for a Marshmallow concert," and I was just like. Well, what about saving for a concert ticket and getting a ride from uh, your dad to to go, you know, to go to uh, to, to go to the O2 Center and you know to see you two, and you're just like at we or like at Wembley, you know, like when you see like Queen in concert at Wembley, you're like, God, I wish I was old enough to have been there, like a hundred thousand people. My kids couldn't give a fuck. <laughs> They're like, because no. I I cling on to the fact that I was at Live Aid and I was yeah. at that Queen concert at Wembley and I was at saw you two at the O2 and I. You know, these things are kind of anchor points they, in my they life. They mattered to me. Yeah, they really mattered to me. Those were really important. I remember seeing you two in Las Vegas, and I just like it really mattered to me. Um, and Mike, just my kids don't think that there's a glory to a crowd as well. I mean, I was a little. I, bit I've always thought so. I've always was, thought so. I was a bit weepy eyed the other day. I caught some something from Glastonbury, and Glastonbury was cancelled this year. And I, a big festival guy. I was a bit weepy eyed, thinking, God, I love a crowd. Yeah. Totally, totally, it's totally. Changed. And it's changed. So final question. What do you think is the big thing people should focus on for the next couple of years? Look, there's a lot of big things out there. What do you say? Look, filter out. Just this is the big thing to focus on. Balance. I know it sounds crazy, but um, extremism is a failed experiment. Balance, moderation, centrism, pragmatism, it wins. And it's the boundary conditions for incredible innovation. And all extremism does is it allows you to see how inefficient it is. It's inefficient. It's also inefficient to have to muster such strong emotions oh. that don't have actual returns. So inefficient. Um, yeah. I mean, that, well, that's a brilliant answer. Jim, listen, thank you. That was really fantastic. I really enjoyed it. It's a real pleasure. Thanks for doing everything that you do. Um, Thank you really, so much. Really and one day we'll be able to get to meet in person. Fantastic. I hope you enjoyed this special episode of the interview, the premier business and finance series in the world. However, this is just the tip of the iceberg. For more in-depth content and expert analysis, visit the membership link in the description to unlock a week's access for only $1. This dollar can change your life.